welcome to Couch Time. I just made that up. I just, we're not going to call this Couch Time. We're at Cascade Sciences. I'm Catherine, and I am here with Sean and Ron from Agilent. Sean O'Brien, Ron Nykirk, not Ron Nykirk, said his name a million times. I know I can say it right. Um, we were just talking about vacuum applications, and we were talking about viscous flow versus molecular flow. And I want to talk about kind of generally what those two things are, and then when we get into molecular flow, what are the different technologies that we'd be using, and what are some advantages and disadvantages? Basically, there's the three regimes of vacuum are based on different pressures. So from atmospheric pressure, whatever that might be, in sea level, it's bigger than it is top of a mountain, but from whatever the existing ambient pressure is, down to these various levels of vacuum, we go through different stages. Viscous flow goes from atmosphere down to the level of about two to three torr. And of course, a torr is 1 760th of the atmospheric pressure at sea level. So, when you get down there, you have directionality of flow. You have uh, molecules that are all going in a direction, they're bumping into each other, and it's kind of like rush hour on the freeway. Okay. Now, as the traffic thins out and the pressure goes down, you get fewer and fewer molecules colliding with each other because the distance between those molecules opens up. And that's called the mean free path. That's how far a molecule can travel before it hits something else, whether it's another molecule, the wall of the chamber, whatever it is. Now, as the pressure continues to go down, we have a point where it's transitioning from viscous to molecular flow. That's called transitional flow. Mm -hmm. So you still have directionality, but you still have the ability for that rogue uh, atom of gas to kind of go against the flow and bounce the other way because it can bob and weave its way through the different molecules. Mm -hmm. Once you finally get down to about 100 millitor or less, now it's just you know, free range motion. You can go anywhere you want. It's not going to uh, impede the, the direction of a gas atom as it goes from one direction to another because the mean free path is so large. So I can't, once there are so few molecules, I can suck as, as I can put a giant pump on there that can suck as much as it wants on that chamber, but if it's only getting to 100 millitor, it's not going to pull anything else out. Well, let's talk about the term suck. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Suck means that you are creating a differential pressure okay. from one point to the other, and the flow will go from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. Okay. Once you get to a point where you no longer have the ability to exert pressure, you don't have the molecules hitting each other okay. and forcing them in direction, then you don't have enough of a differential pressure to affect the motion. Okay. Now we come down to in molecular flow where it's a random chance occurrence of that molecule bouncing around to a point where it can go through the opening of the pump to then use the pump's momentum transfer, whether that's be a diffusion pump or a turbo pump, to move it down through the pump, compress it to a point where another pump, like a scroll pump or a vein pump, can then remove it. Okay, got so, it. Vacuum is created in stages. So to get to a certain level of, of uh, pressure, we call those roughing pumps from atmosphere down to about the point where you go into molecular flow. When you go into a, a lower pressure where you want to get fewer and fewer molecules, that's referred to as high vacuum. We use a different type of pump, say a diffusion pump or a turbo pump, to create even lower pressure. Then we have other pumps that when you want to get even deeper vacuum, we have pumps that are called ion pumps that will handle uh, the uh, gas load from the so minus eight, minus nine range of vacuum. We have titanium sublimation pumps. Again, creating vacuum in stages, different technologies to reach lower and lower pressures. Let's talk for a minute right in there. So just under, um, when we get into the turbo or the diffusion pump. So when we're talking about high vacuum application, Sean, give me a quick explanation of a turbo pump versus a diffusion pump in terms of the technology. How do they 
differ? Sure. So when you get into high vacuum, it's all about where those molecules are traveling. So you want a big inlet for those molecules to have the best chance at entering. So that's why we see turbo pumps or diffusion pumps now have larger inlets so those molecules can have a better chance of randomly entering. Uh, diffusion pump has no moving parts. It is a vapor jet pump. So it has a boiler plate where it's going to heat uh, your pump oil. And that pump oil is going to travel up and create uh, cones or vapor jets. And there's different stages uh, where that oil will come out and it will compress it sequentially until you get uh, a higher density of gas molecules at the bottom. And then it will be exhausted to your four line pump, your scroll pump, or your vein pump. So, it, so something really important to say, and you both said it, but just to be very clear um, a turbo pump, um, just like Ron said, takes over where your roughing pump leaves off. So there's always another pump, whether it's a drive scroll or an oil pump, there's always another pump working while the diffusion pump is working. Because and they work the, together. If the diffusion pump was faced with that level of atmosphere that's like soup, it would just, what happens? Right. It would, uh, so that, that oil vapor mm -hmm. would get blown everywhere. It's not strong enough uh, to pump this thick atmospheric air. Mm -hmm. It uses those heavy oil molecules, which are much larger than any air molecule that you're going to encounter. So that density from that heavy oil molecule is going to help trap and compress. Uh, and that oil air costs molecules. like a million dollars a tablespoon, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is pricey oil, so yeah. you do want to make sure you're opening the valves in the correct order. Right, all the more reason to have automation, like That's on the true. Pure Pass, so you can't mess it up. So a diffusion pump makes oil pyramids that compress things. What is a turbo molecular? Yeah, I, I like that oil pyramid analogy <laughs> and that's definitely, it compresses that gas down. Okay. So a turbo pump has a uh, stator and a turbine and that stator uh, has se several stacks and that's stationary and your uh, rotor is spinning and that has different angles and as a molecule enters the opening of the turbo, it is hit by that rotor. Mm -hmm. And that rotor blade knocks those molecules down. And the stator helps to guide those molecules down as it's compressed farther and farther. The cutaway that you have in Santa Clara at the office of the turbo molecular pump with those stages set in there, there's like probably eight or half a dozen stages mm -hmm. and they're spinning at? They spin over you know, 50,000 and upwards RPMs, so they're spinning 50, and they're 60, right 70. on top of each other. And I've seen a turbo pump that's been spun up and exposed to atmosphere, and it's it it's, it looks like a grenade went off. I mean, it just the the soup, like you said, the density of this atmosphere is like is like soup when it was expecting something really sure. fine. So it, so it's looking for to pump molecules. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's deflecting those molecules and the momentum from those uh, those blades that come around and impact those molecules and they'll knock them down. So when you get a huge rush of air come in, those blades are going to lift up and impact the stator right above them. Right. What do you recommend, Ron, you've been in a lot of uh, botanical extraction labs. We're using highly technical uh, industrial process equipment, oftentimes without the infrastructure that, you know, our neighbors across the street at this Intel fab right across the street, we don't have all that infrastructure. We don't have all of that stuff. We bought this equipment and now we're using it. What, what do you recommend to a user who's using this highly sophisticated equipment and isn't always sure exactly what they're supposed to be doing? I mean, how, what are some principles or things that you've seen that people could maybe avoid some advice, read the manual. I'm not sure. What is, what is... When all else fails, read the manual. Mm -hmm. That is the best advice I can give to everybody that is using equipment of any kind. I know that in certain industries, there's a tendency to want to charge ahead, start using the equipment. Uh, the best thing you can do for yourself, for your investment, for the health and well-being of the equipment is to understand what the equipment is supposed to do, 
what needs to be done to it to maintain its ability to do that, and to understand what maintenance needs to be done as it's being used to make sure it stays in best performance. Mm -hmm. Read the manual. Read the manual. And when all else fails, and the manual's not available, call Cascade Sciences. They'll make sure you have what you need. Yeah. And talk somebody through it. You know, asking a question is a really good way to start. I think that the, if I could give one piece of advice, certainly anybody who's using a diffusion pump and in that kind of application, is the cleaner the environment, the more orderly the environment, the, the better off you're going to be. So the, the less clutter around the equipment, the cleaner it is, the safer it's going to be. I would say clean the heck out of everything and maintain it at a really high level of cleanliness. And that order is going to help the process go better. A clean pump is a happy pump. A clean pump is a happy pump. I think we'll end right there.